Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Dark Souls 2. We are approaching the end of our run here in Drang Lake, but there's still quite a few things to be done. Some little odds and ends about the place that need taken care of. This is a little bit of an interesting encounter in that it requires you strip down to absolutely nothing in order to make sure that your equipment doesn't just die outright from the corrosion of the acid you're in, but uh, other than that, it's still fairly mundane. These dogs, aside from their animations being ridiculous, don't really pose too much of a threat. Mm -hmm. You can easily circle around them, and if you're playing especially careful, take absolutely no damage, but I just want to be done with these two. There we have it. This is a pretty cool place because not only does it kind of show you what Aldia would do with the corpses after he was done with them, but it also really evidences Aldia's affinity for acid. Some corrosive urns in there. Because Aldia, he of course was a horrible experimenter of the most vile kind, but he was also so much more than that. He was really a kind of polymath of, I don't know, ancient Dreng Lake. He had interests that covered almost the entire spectrum of really twisted experimentation. There was nothing that Aldia considered sacred, and by golly, he was not a man you wanted to have messing with you. Come on, come down. These guys used to be one of the better places to farm petrified dragon bones, but now that Shulva is here and it's given us those wonderful, wonderful spawns just all day, every day, we can finally stop bothering with these dragon acolytes, though. At the same time, if you didn't manage to get the dragon acolyte mask from the. Uh, what do I call it? Oh. No witching urn for you, but the dragon acolyte mask from the first ogre in the level, then. I suppose you might actually want to spend some time farming those acolytes. And as I've said before, their helmet is just one of the best pieces of fashion souls I've found to date, and I really, really rate it highly. This is where they introduce you to the mechanic of <laughs> get close to these guys, believe me. We're we're gonna ambush you with them. We're gonna break down walls just to come after you. And they will use that again very soon, if I give them the chance. But I know my way around that particular encounter, so no such luck for them. Keep him in his set of animations. Sometimes you actually have to run around a long way, but it's no big deal. He's still a fat, brutish oaf that just allows you to kind of lock him down. I am being very willy-nilly with the Estus right now, but it's not a big deal. Uh, at this point, Estus heals me for quite the amount, and so I don't have to worry about wasting it or whatnot. I can use a lacerating knife just because I deem them less important than any other sort of throwing knife. The goal here is to actually drag that guy all the way down here and have him break down this locked up door for me. Of course, he's all too happy to oblige, but he can also get locked into the animation of freeing that enhanced undead or the basilisk over there. He kind of gets a little bit distracted when he sees the set pieces. So, if you don't constantly keep him entertained, you will find yourself dealing with a few more enemies than you were necessarily intending to. Three swings, and then he back to the old routine. If I get greedy like that, and actually waste all my stamina, he actually has enough time to come back at me, but... Oh! Oh dear. thought that would have been enough, but it actually... He pulled away, so I whiffed somewhat awful. Grab this. It's a malformed shell. It's basically a worse version of the malformed skull, but, you know, still something to keep in mind if it's something you're after. It's one of those weapons that doesn't scale at all, so it can be nice depending upon your build. Actually, let me check. I think it may scale slightly with strength. Yeah, very, very low strength scaling, but the point is the base damages. That's the real reason for the weapon. 
This guy right here actually has a chance to drop the Chaos Rapier, but that's a Dex Fire weapon, so I have no reason to try and grab that. It's an absolute waste. This is one of those moments, those rare moments, when the item isn't actually a trap. It's honestly your only safe move in this ambush. Oh, those iframes, so great. That's what I love about maximum adaptability, is just you never have to worry. You're basically invincible if you're timing your rolls even remotely consciously. It makes the game a lot easier, but that's what all your stats are going to do. That's what stats are for, is for making the game easier. And with that, we've done a full clear of Aldea's Keep. It's a fairly short and straightforward level, but it has some nice enemies, and I kind of like it. Definitely a fan. Come right on in here, switch to my mace, buff that on up, and we're ready to go dragon hunting. Clearly, this is an incredibly easy AI to abuse, but uh, he does have the nasty habit of flying off at range and then trying to breathe fire at you. Something I don't take very kindly to and intend to punish. You can see how I love the unlocked combat. I always have to you know, draw a note to that just because I sometimes feel that the slightly lower uh, base damages require a little bit of justification. Because something like a Swihander or some other massive greatsword will actually out damage this mace in terms of just sheer hitting power, but I think that the utility of those really intense, fast swings, as well as the directionality of the moveset, allowing you to fight with ease in unlocked combat, is the real selling point. Come right on through here, and it's down for the count. It's quite the uh, paltry dragon there. It's kind of sad. It has been said, based on the Guardian Dragon's soul, let me see if I can find it, that um, do the dragons watch over the land of their own will, or are they in the grip of one of Aldia's spells? Well, it, some people have used... That's just a dragon scale. I don't need it. I'm not going into that covenant just yet. But some people have said that that's proof that Aldia yet lives, possibly as the ancient dragon, but I don't think it's any sort of proof of that at all. We already know that spells can persist after death, specifically because of last game, Gwendolyn. Even if you take the time to head down into his little dark moon chamber and slaughter him off, his entire illusion spell still remains fully intact, so ha having a dragon that's still under one of Aldia's spells goes in no way to proving that Aldia yet lives and is still at large somewhere. I think that the most likely uh, happening is that Aldeo is killed by the ancient dragon, but uh, we can't really be certain. Hopefully they'll give us a little something more to go off of once the rest of the DLC has come out. I'm really looking forward to them tying up some loose ends, maybe giving us a little bit more uh, to go off of in certain situations, as well as maybe giving us a little bit more of an explanation as to where exactly Shulva fits into the lore. It has some definite ties between, uh, what should we call it, Hyde and Lindelt, but nothing that's entirely solid. Like, it still leaves a lot open to interpretation. Dave Control Live actually seems to have some fairly thought out uh, ideas on the subject, but at the same time, I think that the similarities between Shulva and Hyde cannot be overlooked. The fact that they're both Mayan sorts of civilizations with really coastal sink sunken cities is something that should should not be understated. It's it's a definite fact about both civilizations and to say that they're unrelated is folly in my opinion. I think it's very clear that there's at least something connecting the two, even if FromSoftware hasn't necessarily given it to us straight. 
Also, I think that goes a long way to showing that, uh, what do you call it? The old knights aren't servants of Nishandra, as some might claim. I, it really shows that their corruption, their corrosion, is really just uh, an effect of their proximity to the sea. And the fact that they're... It doesn't really explain the Hyde Knights any, but it could very well be that the Hyde Knights are of some sort of relation to the Drakeblood Knights. I don't think that, again, they've given us very much on that, so it's something to be looking out for if you're planning on speculating at all about the lore. Just what sorts of conclusions and corollaries you can be drawing between Hyde and uh, Shulva, and Lundelt especially, given the slumbering dragon shield, which is so iconic. The spells that can be found around Shulva really draw some very nice connections between the Lindelt sect and Shulva as a whole. Even more so when you consider the uh, dragon charm, which is supposed to be the predecessor of the monastery charm, and the toxicity of Shulva as a whole from, what's his face, Sin, the toxic dragon. So I, I definitely think there's a lot of connections to be drawn from that. It's not quite perfect, but it is definitely interesting. I think Shulva, if we are going to be going into the whole idea of sort of repeating times, cycles in Dragon Lake, which they, they really hit upon a little bit harder than they did in Dark Souls 1, I think that Shulva would be the best candidate for the predecessor to Hyde. And while that doesn't necessarily mesh with the idea that Hyde is the landing of Guinevere and Flan and all the other gods from Man Orlando, we still don't have legitimate confirmation on that. It's simply the theory of best fit at this point. So it's just something to be thinking about. This here, Dragon Irie, is really nice in that it gives us quite a lot of drops, a lot of really worth ah worthwhile Titanite Lizards and some drakes to kind of keep us distracted. I suppose they're technically wyverns, but that's besides the point. But uh, the problem I have with it is that it takes so many clears to go through. Not only do you have to add another clear for every time you miss a single Titanite Lizard, which you basically are guaranteed to do on your first time through unless you're a spellcaster and focusing on the Lizards before taking out the Petrified... Uh, not the Petrified, but the... Uh, drakes and wyverns that are in the center of every little hub of the wizards, but also because there's some, this is where they first introduced the idea of drops and loot that you absolutely have to homeward bone from, which I think is fair considering they, at the beginning of this section, give you free access to the Aged Feather, which is a guarantee at this point in the game that you won't have to sacrifice anything in order to grab the loot and be on your merry way. But at the same time, I still don't like the idea of hafting to bonfire in order to continue clearing the level. I want to be able to grab my drop, possibly drop down to an earlier section of the level, but still continue on my merry way. Bash. Oh dear. I've lost it. Never try and follow up with that lizard, because if you do, you're basically offering yourself up to this here dragon. Very little good can come of chasing down that lizard, and your chances of killing it past the initial drop-down are incredibly small. Very rarely have I managed to successfully come out ahead versus that lizard after missing the first blow. You can see these uh, wyverns, dragons, things are fairly easy to abuse. You just stand between their legs, roll out whenever they try stepping, and just swing away and s till oh I just realized I don't have my rings equipped. Goodness me. That would explain why my stamina's taking so long, I don't have quite as much, as well as the fact that I'm not doing as much damage with each hit. I don't have my ring of blades equipped. So let me let me remedy that before I go on. Extra stamina, extra damage, extra souls, and what's the last one? 
Yes, the second dragon ring. There we are. We will be grabbing the third dragon ring fairly shortly, and so I'm kind of looking forward to having that. It takes it all the way up to a stunning 10% bonus to life, stamina, and equip weight. Oh my god. Stop. Lizard, please. There we go. Not too hard. Now is it? And finally, we just go around collecting the little bits of loot that they so conveniently left around the chamber for us, and then we finally move on to uh, trigger the shortcut of the level. There's only those three real instances. There's three of the unstable hollows and three massive wyverns to uh, kind of mess with your day, but aside from that, this is actually a very empty level that's really only there to give you bits of loot, which I'm totally okay with, but not only loot, I suppose it also fulfills a very aesthetic role. Like, it, it has a very clear theme of the very rocky outcroppings, the kind of plateau column looking structures, as well as just dragons as a whole, be it their eggs or skeletons, bones, the, just dragons in general. And so, while it's not necessarily the most interesting level to be clearing through, it definitely gives the player a lot in terms of items, as well as an aesthetic to drink in, so... I still like it, especially because it's extremely valuable in to be aestheticing this place in order to respawn all the lizards, respawn all the drakes, more souls, more titanite, more drops, more everything. If you have spare bonfire aesthetics and perhaps were running low on some of your special titanite or whatnot and just wanted a quick little boost of all that instead of heading through the DLC once again, this is the place to go. Because most of the DLC drops actually come from metal chests, so they're not going to be nice and respawn for you. You're going to have to actually enter a new new game cycle in order to get more of those. That crystal lizard's a lost cause, but this guy right here is extremely placid. Waits for you to just come up and tap him on the back once. I should have enough. Now I need one more chunk before I can finally upgrade my last weapon of the playthrough up to par. And once I do, I'm actually going to switch to that instead of these two for a while, just so I can start familiarizing myself with its moveset and really figuring out how I want to be using it properly. Because at this point, I haven't done too much with the Red Iron Twin Blade, and so I really don't know how it's going to handle. Just a few early swings about to kind of see what its deal was, how it was going to be handling just in general. Nothing very conclusive or definitive about how I'm going to be using it. Oh, I guess I left that intact, but I can be back for it later. Ugh. Come on, come on. There we go. I almost borked that up. Let's just continue on. There's a drop right here and a final lizard before I've cleared this area. Down the end there, there's also a, another place you can drop off to loot, but I'm not going to bother with that just yet because there's still another lizard. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Ah, and I borked that encounter. So it looks like I'm going to take at least three paths through in order to clear, but I, I suppose that's okay because that is pretty much what's necessary just to get the random drops that can be garnered around the level this little bugger again. Sprint off this time so I can get the little bit of distance. And that's how you're supposed to take him out. Did I grab this? Yes. So there's one crystal lizard left and two guaranteed drops left, so let's just grab those while we're here. So I'll have a brave warrior, and right over here is another one. Another ferrous lockstone in case you're not already drowning in those. Which, I suppose if you're not a member of the Rat Covenant, you might not be drowning in them, but at the same time, uh, Rat Covenant members are the only ones who are going to get any extra use out of it, too, so... Eh. It's really a bit of loot for all you non-secret sores out there, so... I can basically bypass it every time, but I, I can't. I can't grab it. I can't skip it every time. I need it. It's a horrible, horrible cycle, but that's the game I play. Drop on down. Oh! That could have been a little bit dicey, but 
I pick up 20,000 souls for the trouble. It's definitely one of the most worthwhile drops. It's rather nice. It's not too important, but it's a good chunk of souls. Like I, I would never say that that's in a small amount until you're at least into higher new game cycles, like plus two or plus three, at which point your best bet's probably just to clear a few more bosses, maybe a Seteca boss here or there, because 20,000 is not going to be too important, except for maybe allowing you the last little bit of purchasing from some merchant that you didn't quite clear the first time through. And I decided to come around from the back just because I didn't... I think it's a little bit shorter and I didn't want to head through the whole level again. But at the same time, once I either pass or fail this lizard, I'm going to be heading on. Hopefully it has a Titanite chunk, because that would be rather sad if I still didn't have the ability to... Could you, could you stop? Could you stop? There we go. No! No! Oh my goodness. Well, it doesn't matter what it had, because... We're getting out of here. Spent enough time here. I'm just going to Homeward Bone because it's faster than actually walking. And from the bonfire, you can just hop up the ladder and head down the zip line. It's a much quicker route than actually finishing off the level on foot. Especially on PC. I might not agree with that statement if this were console, but because the load times on PC are just non-existent, it's definitely the better strategy for heading on through here. Depending upon how many of the eggs you've been smashing throughout the level, the dragons here will actually come at you a little bit quicker than otherwise, so that's what that mechanic is there for. If anyone was wondering why there's just a bunch of smashable dragon eggs, uh, smashing those will actually increase the rage of the dragons flying about, and if you've smashed enough, you can't actually make it across the bonfire in time before one of the drakes comes down and smashes its talons in the middle and really wrenches the, the bridge apart. That'll come back once you respawn, but it's just something to keep an eye on, something to be wary of. Here we come to one of the more dangerous enemies in the game, these drake keepers. As you can see, blunt damage will really shred them something awful, but they can pose quite a threat no matter what your character is, especially the mace-wielding hollows as we'll be getting towards. And as I was saying, the dragon eggs that are just dotted around the level are just kind of a little bit of a trap for the unaware. Because you'll probably end up smashing quite a fair bit, especially if you're heading through all the secrets. But at the same time, using the aged feather or a homeward bone, or even just dying, will immediately reset them all, so I don't have to worry too much, especially because I know I'm going to be using that several times throughout the level in order to acquire the maximum amount of loot. I personally don't like to take him on just yet. I can come down and take him on later, but with the priest's priestess up here, it's best not to take the risk. Immediately take him out, and if there's no lightning bolt incoming... Uh, Okay. It's best not to take that lightning bolt there just because it has a chance of breaking the chest, especially if you checked it as a mimic. And that's something that I kind of don't agree with about this game, is that they actually allow enemy blows to break chests, as well as your own. But I guess it makes sense in keeping with the mechanic of just breaking the chest, so... I'm not going to call him out on it too badly. It's just something that I'd rather not see there because there's a few areas in the game where it can be fairly difficult to extract the enemies from their closest uh, chest. The two areas that come to mind are the Dragon Charm, guarded by a regular Gurm at the beginning of the Doors of Pharos, and also the uh, Repair Powder and Torch that are guarded by the... Varangian with a pair of scimitars right above in, whatchamacallit, No Man's Wharf. Both of those sections can give you a little bit of, oh, that, that follow-up swing is what really makes him dangerous, is because while his moveset comes out so fast even on its own, the thrust for the old knights, which these guys are a carbon copy of, actually is much quicker 
than the thrust that the old knights would give, which was already at a pretty fair clip. That was one of their only real dangerous moves that could snag you if you were being cocky, because of course you know that the old knights are not a threat whatsoever. So it's just something to keep in mind. Play it safe. Best not be greedy. The words. Whack. It gets a little bit dicey down at that last little bit of stamina because after that fourth hit, you don't have an option of rolling away. Uh, because right when they come out of their real curled up defensive chest position, they immediately open up with a grab, which will hit you if you're to the sides or right behind or any sorts of locations near the chest when it opens up. Your only option is to just back off as fast as you can. Those of you with an eye for detail might actually recognize this relief here. This is actually the exact same scene that's portrayed behind Ilana, the Squalid Queen. So we know for a fact that either Aldia visited somewhere in Shulv at one point or another, but I think that this is a much better explanation that uh, this place was actually built before the Sanctuary of Sin, especially because the scene depicted is actually the birth of Shanalot. It's also the same exact uh, scenes that are depicted in the Shrine of Winter, so you can actually check that out if you have some spare time. It's always best to look at this relief though, just because it's in such better detail and you can actually really see what's going on instead of having it split up into the four vignettes that the Shrine of Winter has. Though, honestly, the relief down in Shulva is much, much bigger and is a better view. Considering, though, that it is the, a depiction of the birth of Shanalot, I think that's why I, I think that it shows that the Dragon Shrine was built before Shulva's Sanctuary, specifically because... Uh, Shanalot is Aldia and Vendrick's creation. Mainly, mainly Aldia, but maybe a little bit of Vendrick in there too. I hold that Vendrick actually did very, very little besides dits about with golems, while Aldia did all the real work with souls. Though Vendrick, being the more important brother, gets all the credit. Um, as you can see, since it's depicting the birth of Shanalot, the dragon egg, and the woman being birthed from that, that it's it's quite clear that these are depictions of Aldia's and quite possibly Vendrick's experiments that resulted in Shanalot. And so we know that Shulva was likely drew inspiration from the uh, pair of monarchs. But at the same time, there's also a bit of interesting play in between which came first, the chicken or the egg, because the Drake blood knights actually have the double dragon insignia of Drang Lake on their shields, which can be read in a, a multitude of different ways. I personally think that it's a sign that they were actually knights of Drang Lake, but at the same time, the given the connections between Lindelt and Shulva, you could also read it as Shulva is older, it's the progenitor of both the double dragon symbol and the uh, Lindelt sect that has kind of migrated on over to uh, the Shrine of Amana. So there, there's a lot of really interesting bits of lore to be fiddling around with in your head. I don't think that they've given us anything quite concrete enough to make a positive statement one way or another, but they definitely gave us enough to speculate about, and that's some of the best fun you can have with lore just rattling around ideas in your head, coming up with ideas that fit, thinking about how all the little characters and scenes and items and enemies all interrelate and kind of connect to one another. Personally, I think the lore is one of the best parts about Dark Souls and is one of the biggest reasons why Dark Souls 2 doesn't quite live up to Dark Souls 1, is that the lore was just so severely borked. Come on through here. While it looks like they've got their shields up for quite a long time, there's actually only a few uh, frames in their thrust that are actually being blocked by their shields. The problem is that 
Yeah, you can see their stun lock is absolutely god awful. Just does not end. Especially when there's a pair of them. Okay, the other one's down below. I think I can squeeze off some damage. Mm. Maybe if I get a sprinting attack? Yes. Boom, that's the kill. Just roll on out. Don't want nothing to do with this. Roll, roll, roll my boat. Get me around the hollow. Oh, okay. This is time to back off again. Heal it up. This level is kind of a test of endurance, and so I recommend that, especially on your first try, if you're trying to uh, face the ancient dragon actually as a combatant, that you definitely take the time to either clear the level completely, like make sure everyone stops respawning, or you just dash on through, as most of the encounters can be avoided if you're sprinting straight into the boss fog. The one thing that I would also recommend is that you have the Covetous Gold Serpent Ring equipped because the sword and shield wielding Drake Keepers have a chance to drop their sword, which is legitimately one of the best straight swords in the entire game. It's just such a good weapon. And that's what we came here for. Good old kindly ancient dragon has bestowed upon us the dragon the ashen mist heart which will allow us to enter memories and dits about in there in order to gather quite a number of souls. Not not all of them giant. But you know what, let's let's handle that now. The Ashen Mist Heart at this point gives you access to five new locations. It used to only be four, but with the DLC, they gave you a fifth one that I'm going to be heading towards after all the others. But for now, it's just one last final clear through this level in order to get to the end and pay the old dragon corpse a visit. There might be something special waiting for us. Who knows? On through. I do like to kill the basilisks just because they have a chance at dropping rare stones. So, just in case they have anything worthwhile, it's something I might want to grab while I'm here. Honestly, since this character is going for just purely normal damage, I don't know why I bother. But, you know, considering, I'm going to also open that door that I didn't really touch on the first time around, so... It's actually a rather productive trip. Kind of glad I saved it now. Gosh. Bunch of hit-and-run tactics. Oh, want to get away because they're going to surround me. At this point in the game, you can clear through almost every earlier section by sheer virtue of how much Estus you have. No matter how much damage, if, especially if you've invested at least a little bit in Vigor, you will be able to walk away, heal it on up with all the lovely Estus you've gathered, and head back into the fray. This chamber is opened by the Brightstone key that Lord Seldora uh, drops upon his death. And as another note, it's actually how we know his name is Lord Seldora, despite the fact that he's often referred to as the Duke, both in Freya's soul description as well as all the weapons that can be built from that. So it is something to note that while it is clear that uh, he had some sort of royal status, it's it's never certain exactly what it is. I kind of chalk it up to similarly to how the drakes, dragons, worms, wyverns, etc. are always referred to. It's very interchangeable. I don't think that they were translated particularly well, and I don't even think that the Japanese language itself really handles those very well. I don't think it has the same distinctions that uh, English has, so I think that's where the ambiguity comes from. Because, as I will show you right now, the uh, Seldora Den key, not not the Den key, that's not what I want, the Brightstone key, the eccentric Lord Seldora. But at the same time, if you come on over to the soul, let's give that a find, soul of the Duke's loyal Freya. It's, it is extremely uh, imprecise about it. It claims both to be correct, and so there's really no knowing as the player 
whether it's he's a duke, whether he's a lord. And again, I, I really just think that it's a poor translation from the Japanese. Not necessarily that there can be a better translation, but simply that there is no proper translation for it in English. I would be interested if any of you out there, or if anyone's heard of someone who's actually played the Japanese version of the game and possibly had a chance to translate that directly. Maybe they're bilingual or whatnot, but at the same time, I don't really expect that. All I know is that this game, in the English version at least, refers to Lord and Duke Seldora as the same person, so not much to be said there. This little crystal here never been here before but it is here now and has something to do with the dragon up there and once we enter we actually find that it shows the death of this dragon it's the dragon's memory just like with the giant memories we'll be entering later uh, the actual corpse holding the memories and the soul itself is dead within the memory it's the Memories of the last moments. In the background, you can see the shattered arc trees. That dates this to the very end of the gray period of this land's history. At the very dawn of the first age of fire, when uh, Gwyn and possibly many others in other continents, such as Drang Lake, as this dragon shows, uh, kind of went about eradicating the dragons, usurping their rule and taking the lands for themselves. Well, apparently, it doesn't want me using the bonfire. Though, something I need to check is still at two chunks, but hopefully, hopefully, and that's all I can really say about it, is Chloe-Anne will have at least a limited supply of chunks in her inventory now, and I can use one of those to upgrade my red iron twin blade. Let us see. Yes. Yes, in fact, she does. So I can grab that. I, as you can see, I've got plenty of twinkling and petrified dragon bones, so that's not really something I need to be worrying about. And Lenagrast here. Give me the last final levels, and I can really switch up to a new weapon. Kind of breathe some life into the combat now, instead of just hacking away as I always do. Also, it turns out I was right. It does go all the way up to a A-rank scaling. How much does it weigh? It weighs a whole 14, so I am gaining 4 units of weight, but that's not too terrible, especially because I recently gathered the third dragon ring, which increased my carrying capacity by that extra percentage. Get my Estus as high as I can. Also want to level up, spend some of these souls so I don't have them just eating their way through my pockets. I believe I was upgrading attunement some, so... And put me at 48, that leaves two extra levels, and I'm sure I can soul vessel some out of adaptability once I've got that all up, but I want to make sure I hit 150 before I do that. The next question is whether I should uh, head to the giant memories, or... Yeah, I, th I think I'm going to go to the giant memories. I was considering heading over to Vengarl's head in order to pick up the red rust swords, but uh, I don't have enough souls for that at the moment, so... I'm just going to clear through the main level. At this point, I don't even want to bother with all these hollows. They're just not worth my time. They're going to give me a complete pittance of souls, and there's just no real reason to bother with them. This is always the giant memory that I take on first, and I'm actually kind of scared that the giants are going to pose quite the challenge for this character because I have no sorts of range damage. This memory in particular is always the hardest if you don't, so it may turn out that I actually skip through most of the giants, whereas I normally wouldn't. Captain Drummond here is just kind of minding his own business, but I want his helmet, and so I'm gonna be a little bit of a bad guy. I do like that secondary swing. It's kind of got a lot of damage, especially because the damage is already so high to begin with. I'm really actually kind of happy with... Oh. Well, okay then. Something you may not know is that you can actually backstab this giant if you can get around to behind him, but it doesn't look like he really wants to let me do that. So, I'm not going to show it to you just yet. 
perhaps with one of the giants later on in the level. Hopefully, the uh, little poison infatuated giant over there. I want to split these up, have one of them actually follow me in here because facing two giants at a time, especially in a very melee focused build, is just a terrible idea in general. Oh, oh goodness, no rolls. Well, that's not very nice of him. Yeah, he didn't really give me much of a chance there, but I suppose I shouldn't have been trying to take on a giant head-on. It's a fairly silly move, even though he can attack me while I'm on the ground. It's not, it's not a very fair thing to be doing. I've got plenty of human effigy, so I can just pop that away and get right back into the fray, but it's still an annoyance. Coming around, ignore these guys again, just because, again, no real point to them. The ladder's just a bit of wasted time in order to save a smidgen of health, so I'm not going to bother. Come right on through. There we are. It's a lovely looking giant. Absolutely fantastic specimen. Something that I've considered is that uh, there, there may actually be a connection, there may actually be a reason for why, oh, goodness, I forgot this doorway right here, but there's actually a connection between the giants and the uh, trees that they sprout. If you actually look at the giant's soul, you can see that it's got the dark soul within itself, but at the same time it's also surrounded by light. And I think that's a fair connection between uh, the giant souls and the initial Age of Grey. Their, their souls sort of combine the two the light and darkness together to make the gray of nature that was the dragons and the arch trees and so while I don't expect that they're gonna sprout an arch tree with every giant corpse at the same time I do think that there's something to be said about the connection there let's see if I let's see what the one-handed move sets like just a really broad swing I can deal with that these guys tracking is just absolutely insane so Deal with them as any way you can, because believe me, they, they are not going to play nice. Especially the ones later on in the level that will throw fireballs that will stagger you once you've been hit, and possibly hit you again at the moment you're standing up. They're very evil, these guys. But as I was saying, the uh, their sort of gray soul kind of provides the perfect basis for miniaturized arch trees, just as they're not quite... Uh, on the level of dragons, so too can it be said that the trees sprouted from their souls are not quite on the level of arch trees. I believe there's loot in here somewhere. Maybe not. Maybe it's up in the rafters. Let's head on up there. This is basically the only way you can handle this encounter in melee, especially because of these two horrible little bastards up here. If you're trying to fight them at range, you've got kind of a chance, but in melee, you, you basically just have to avoid them for long enough to actually get a kill, and then you can sort of take on the remaining one out. Oh, you can see what I mean about that. And their timing is just so utterly evil in that right as you finish killing, I mean standing up from the first hit, the second hit is bound to hit if they're lobbing them from the rooftops which, as you can see, they are, but I'm actually on the rooftop as well, so it's a little bit more fair. Goodness. So much Estus use, but it's because they're a very, very unfair encounter. There's really no way to face them in a smart manner, just because, the, well, at least with a pure melee build. That is the caveat I have to introduce every time I talk about that, because uh, there is a smart manner to face them, it's just that the smart manner is ranged, and since I've devoted entirely to the melee build, that's, that's not an option I have. It's not something I can allow myself in this playthrough. I really should have healed before I came over here, but that's all hindsight. It's 2020. Now I can come down and face the final giant alone, which is a much, much more fair fight, just because there's only one of them. He still has the incredibly broken hitboxes, but it's it's nowhere near as bad. Especially because there's only one, and I don't have ranged opponents 
raining death on me from above. I can sort of focus my rolls and my evasion on this single enemy. There we go. There we go. And that's all for this memory. I want out as fast as possible just because... Oh, there's almost forgot the two bits of loot. Old Radiant Life Gem, which can be useful on bosses if you're running low on Estus, as well as a Soul of the Great Hero. So, again, 20,000 souls. Don't want to pass that up. Especially because that'll go pretty much the entire way for paying my way to upgrade the Red Rust Scimitar when I eventually grab that. I did decide that that was the one I was going to be heading for. There's another giant around here, and I know there's the one upstairs, but I don't think that's the one I'm headed for just yet. It may be. Let me see. Let's just head right there and see whether it is the one I'm talking about. I am just going to go in with this reduced amount of Estus because I've got plenty of life gems that I've been hoarding and I kind of want to start burning those off. At least somewhere. Just because I'm never going to use those past this section of the game. And at this point they're just burning a hole in my pocket. Up on hope. Which most items tend to do, but life gems actually have a fair use. So it's not something I try to forget. Yeah, this is the next place. I like to enter the memory of Jake as the sort of finale, just to kind of en finish it off with a big boss fight. It feels more cinematic that way. Now I just need to kind of remember where his memory is, but I'll figure that out in due time. It's not important right now, as I have this memory to concern myself with. Come on. Come on. There we go. I noticed that I could get the kill on these guys instantaneously with the strong attack, so that's what I'm focusing on. This uh, longstone contraption is kind of a little bit of a trick in that, yes, it activates this secret door over here, but that lockstone contraption right there does not activate this secret door. This one's actually just a regular illusory wall that you can activate by touching it, whereas that ferris contraption actually activates this slot shooting out saw blades at you the entire time, so you can actually really screw yourself over because you're going to get hit in the face with that. Come on over here, grab this. That's the steel set from the Baronite Knights from Dark Souls 1, and a Fire Seed, just in case you don't quite have that at max just yet. And that's all for the indoor secrets, I believe. You can head right on up. You immediately turn to your right and see this horrible enemy. I don't know if I've made it clear enough just yet, but I absolutely hate the fire-wielding ones, and luckily enough, he is the only one in this level. It is nice to come around while this giant is distracted with the, uh... I suppose they're not hollow just yet, but the, uh... Dragon Lake Knights that are dotting the rooftop. Usually he manages to destroy that ballista there, which gives you a straight shot over to this guy, but apparently he wasn't feeling like being on too much of a rampage. The other thing that's especially useful about this Red Iron Twin Blade is, as you can see, my durability has barely gone down at all, and I've already cleared my way through a pair of Giant's Memories. It really just has an incredible amount of base durability, a full 175, and despite taking the uh, slightly higher rate of damage that the Twin Blade weapons actually take, it still manages to just tank through it because of its massive base. Kill this guy. Come right on up. Depending upon whether or not you have range, you want to take down these archers from the base of the ladder, but I do not, so I have to come up here and play the Valiant Soldier type in person. Luckily, they do have reduced health bars, so you can just cut them down with no real effort. I can see that there are chests in there, and I know there's some way to get in there. It's just I haven't figured it out, and I still haven't bothered to actually look it up. Not least of all because there's a giant in there, but uh, I don't really know 
nor particularly care what's in there, just because I don't really think that it would turn this whole area into a really worthwhile endeavor. Dart back in here, dart out, and immediately come off to the side so that I can avoid this little kamikaze jerk who's jumping right on down on top of you, and that's all she wrote for this area. Pick up this last bit of loot and head on. Now it's just a matter of trying to remember where the final giant lord's memory of Jag is, and I'm really racking my brain right now, but nothing's really coming to me. I'll figure it out once I make my way back to the bonfire, but... Oh, that's right, it's behind the uh, king's door. That's behind the soldier's key. They kind of separate that one off that so that you don't really remember it too well, unless you... At the same time, you could also say that they're specifically drawing your attention to it with the king's door, because you can't get into it early game. They're kind of specifically telling you, once you have the king's ring, something important is behind this door, so I can, I can sort of see that. Really, a whole 600 damage. This is sickening. It's more than enough to kill two of them in a the single damage, so that's quite a bit. Chloranthi ring into king's ring into chloranthi ring. The great thing about it is that you don't have to keep the king's ring equipped, but it does suck that these doors reset every time that you walk away from them. Or they they reset just like environmental hazards and boxes and crates and stuff. Anytime you die or head through a load screen, homeward bone even, they pop right back up in their old places, so... Blech. Come right on into here. There are two Twinkling Titanite down there, but it's faster just to head right on into the memory and then grab those, because otherwise you have to homeward bone and then head into the memory. Come on up. This is the only memory with a fog gate in it, which is actually kind of interesting, but I think it's just to kind of warn you that you're in for something a little bit special. There's actually a boss fight at the end of this memory, and they kind of want to let you know at least a little bit what you're in store for. Best idea here is just to completely ignore any sorts of enemies that you're coming across. That head will be rolling its way on over, but you can easily avoid its path want to come right on here and this guy is not playing around his steps are incredibly uh, have really good tracking really massive shockwave that lasts incredibly long and his he has a bunch of really sweeping moves that actually turn his body so it's not like you can just stand behind him as you can with the last giant this one is actually a little bit wise to your tricks Though, nothing can withstand a plus 10 strength weapon, chip and weapon chipping away at its ankles for that long. So, there we have it. Now we have the giant's kinship, and we could beat the game at this point if we were so inclined. But I have a few things that I need to wrap up before I really want to close out the game. That being said, that is going to be all for this episode. I'm going to grab the Twinkling Titanite and return to Majula spend some of these souls. I am gonna take the time to also head on over to the Shaded Wood and grab the Red Rust weapons, but that's just a small little side trip, so it's nothing too important. I just want to have those so that I can immediately spend my all these souls and upgrade those before I necessarily head out of my way and return to Majula. Sort of a way of reminding myself to set aside the souls necessary. Basically by doing it before I've actually spent them. So, that's the strategy. Come right on over. This area, I at first thought, was going to be a bit tricky, just in my first playthrough, but once you realize that you can just follow the left or right hand walls to uh, work your way entirely through the level without any sort of confusion, it's a bit of a breeze. It's, it really just becomes an inconvenience that you can't see. Excuse me. There we go. This broad sweeping move set is really useful for just those guys. There's no way they're getting out of that. Is there anything else I want? No? That's good. You have fun. 
you can kill him, it's just, there's no real point. He's, he's not doing anything. Can't really fight back. But, I'm having a little bit of fun. The playthrough's wrapping up, and so, I can go about hitting on some of the uh, less important NPCs. When we're bumped back, and then I'm going to warp over to Majula and spend these great gobs of twinkling titanite that I've gathered. Not to mention that I've got all these souls that need spending. I do actually have enough to fully upgrade two boss soul weapons, but none of them really fall into the uh, scope of this playthrough, so I, I don't think I'm going to be spending any of my, my souls there. Ornifex may have something special for me, and I know that Strayed has a lot of really good stuff, but eh, I, I just really don't want to be frivolous with it at this, at this point. There we go. That's the Red Rust. Do I actually have enough? I can upgrade my... No, that's the second helm. I just need a single bit of Twinkling Titanite, and then I can upgrade my gloves all the way to their max. Level up twice, once into attunement and another time into vitality, just to get the absolute max out of that. And just because we're doing some housekeeping, let's head on over to the uh, things betwixt and spend my souls there. Not my souls, but my soul vessel, as well as all of the uh, smooth stones that we've collected throughout the playthrough. We're basically at the end of collecting those, so now's as good a time as any. She's all nicey nice. Get most of my stats just immediately back up to their regular values. The only things that we're going to be adjusting really are attunement and adaptability. Perhaps sticking some extra points in at some odd locations if I really feel the need, but for now, let's just focus on those. Grab this up to 20 just so I can use that. And now I need to get my agility to 105. That gives me three extra points to a lot. So I could actually increase my attunement all the way up to 16, which is perfect in case I want to take the time and finish up Navland's quest line, which honestly I can't do until I die, but of no matter. I'm going to die sometime, shortly. Oh. I... <laughs> Uh, yeah. Now it comes back to bite me in the butt. I forgot. This is the character that I forgot to trigger that on, so now you've got to see me kind of slash my way through these really obnoxious enemies in order to get to the top. Just to, gonna ignore him. There's no real point. He's not a threat at all. I could probably beat him down with my fists in no time flat. Honestly, I know for a fact I could, just because the deprived has to clear through those first few enemies completely with his fists at base level, so you know that there's absolutely no challenge to be had back there. The only thing that they might do is try and distract me while I'm dropping all the uh, smooth stones. Will they actually follow you in from that room? I don't think they will. First things first, make sure I don't have to bother with that again, and now I can begin the arduous process of dropping all 28 of these bit boring, but it's just a little time consuming. I'll put in a timestamp so you can actually skip to the end of this, or at least the portion where I start looting everything. There we are. Now we've got this massive stack, and it's actually going to be picked up in the same order that I was dropping it in. So first we're going to go through the first 13 smooth and silky, small smooth and silky stones. So souls, just crimson water, amber herbs. A lot of it's going to be useless. Old mundane stone, that's arguably useful. Divine blessing, that's one of the better things you can get from there. 
more souls, more herbs, herbs, poison stone. This might actually be the start of the, yeah, I think this is the start of the smooth and silky stone, so some upgrades, some cracked red eye orbs are honestly the worst possible trade. Petrified dragon bone is nice. I'm honestly hoping for just a single twinkling. Like that, th that is kind of the ideal drop right now, just so that I can get my gloves up that one last little level, but it doesn't look like they want to give it to me. Titanite chunk, that would have been nice earlier. More slabs that I don't need ever. Oh, finally an old whip. Finally an old whip. <laughs> uh, those are going to be absolutely worthless on this character, and more trident, channelers trident, so yeah. Nothing really too useful, but now I have those out of my inventory and I can finally be content with that. So, coming up next, we actually get to face the Ancient Dragon. That'll be at the start of the next episode, so I hope to see you get then. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Have a nice day.